So good evening. And isn't this lovely? I mean, we weren't sure how many people would show up, and we just set up a couple circles of chairs, and we had to add in part of another circle. So we were pretty darn close, and we didn't know it. So anyway, welcome. My name is Ann Mulkey, and um, I'm a part of the Peace Center here in San Antonio. And the Peace Center um, does the nominations and selections of the laureates every year. And so we have with us some of our laureates this evening, not all of our Peace Laureates were able to be here. This is the first time that we brought our laureates together, and they are um, selected and chosen based on their years of ongoing committed service to peace in this world, and also because of their ongoing wisdom. And that's how we select the laureates. And um, so with us this evening, I'm just going to go around the circle, and, and each person can kind of raise their hand. But um, Rosie Castro, who's Rosie, she is our 2015 uh, Peace Laureate this year. Um, Sister Maya is sitting next to her. Uh, one year, we, we made the entire group of the Incarnate Word Sisters um, the Peace Laureates. And so Sister Maya is representing them this evening. And then we have Rabbi Sam Stahl and his wife Lynn. And they were the laureates for last year. I'm sorry, the current word was what year? I always get this messed up. 2012? 12. 2012. And uh, Sam and Lynn are 2014, last year's laureates. And um, I've also invited Rosalind Collier. She's co founder of the Peace Center and on the board of the Peace Center now. Uh, so she's sitting in as well. And Omar Shakir, and you were 2011, maybe? <laughs> this is a test. <laughs> I was the year before the sisters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you paved the way. <laughs> but a lot of wisdom in the room. So what brought this group about? Um, I don't think I have to say much about where we find ourselves in the world today and trying to figure out what do we do with so many things happening that have a violent nature to them. Um, and so last summer we were having conversations at the Peace Center and what could be done. And we were talking about showing a film and having a discussion, not a bad thing, dialogues, there's all sorts of kind of conversations. What what could we do? Because what we were discovering is that some of the folks in our community who had developed relationships, important relationships over the years, were not coming together because of things that were happening. What do we do with that? So we have done this in the past. When we have questions like that, we will call our laureates and ask them, you know, do you have advice? And so I called the stalls. And um, Sam recommended highly that um, we come together that we build relationships for times like these, and that we must trust those relationships that we have built, and come together and see each other face to face, and have those important conversations about things that we might see differently, but to trust those relationships. And, and that's how peace, you know, is really important, that we build these relationships for moments just like this, not for when things are going great. That's when we build them. And so um, we really listened to that, we talked about it, and so um, Rabbi Stahl and Lynn invited laureates to come, and those who were able to come tonight have come. And so they're going to model for us this evening uh, compassionate conversation, or you should have a hand out there, it's called living room conversations, um, that are happening across the U.S. And these can happen in your living room or community centers or places of prayer and that type of thing. But um, so basically those rules that are there. And you can pick an, a topic or an issue to have those around. And tonight's topic is not prejudice in our world. So they're going to um, converse about this. Sam and Lynn are going to begin the conversation. And it's just a conversation. And they're going to model for us how to do that. And we're going to watch and listen. And then about in a half hour, we're going to take a five minute time period to talk in pairs of threes about what we've heard and to come up with questions that you can enter into the conversation. And then they're going to go back into the conversation with your questions. Okay? But we'll get to that. I'll be the official timekeeper so they don't have to worry about that. 
And um, so I just want to say real quick, take a moment to take a deep breath for all of us in silence. And then our time together be blessed, let it be compassionate, and let it be good and deep conversation. So I hand it over to Lynn and Sam. I'm going to start by saying, I, it's okay. um, I think that theoretically I am not a prejudiced person. I really espouse loving everybody until I'm confronted with something real. <laughs> and something I say all the time, which is plaguing me all the time, is that I become prejudiced, most prejudiced against prejudiced people. And it's tough when I'm in a conversation and somebody is slamming gay, people who are gay, or people who are, um, who are Muslims, or all kinds of people. And I, I have to constantly look at what that prejudice is, and, and I, I hope we can think tonight about how prejudice impacts each of us on a personal level, because as long as we keep it out there, it, we're not going to have any transformation. And transformation, I think, comes when we are willing to look at our own demons. My demons come from fear. I mean, I really believe that we are either in love or fear. So I'm going to pass this on, but it's something that I would like to talk about if we could amongst the six of us to begin with. <clears throat> One of the causes of prejudice is I think that everybody is uncomfortable with anybody who is different, regardless of what that difference is. It could be a difference in political orientation, uh, race, religion, ethnicity, uh, whatever. And uh, I personally relate to this topic of prejudice because I grew up in an era of genteel anti-Semitism when I realized when I was living in Sharon, Pennsylvania as a child that there was a, a club that I wasn't able to enter because Jews weren't welcome there. I knew that if I wanted to go to medical school someday, that there was a quota on the number of Jewish students that would be admitted. So I and, and uh, we grew up in a community where a uh, tiny percentage of the people were Jewish, so I was really the other there. So I personally have experienced it, and I think everybody around this circle has experienced it as being the other in some way or another. We're always the other to somebody. Oh, they have their own. Oh, yes. <laughs> when I uh, think of prejudice uh, in the same way that I just heard, Part of what happens is it's never, I'm never the one that has the prejudice. Of course, I mean, I'm Mexican, we're the ones that are the victims. Um, and I think of people saying, well, you're people. And immediately I react. And I think the challenge is we, how do we suspend our own judgment about prejudice and make some room for maybe? welcoming the fact that there could be a, a misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge or relationship. And then take that as an opportunity to allow others to learn and to get to know. Because you can't love what you don't know or the people you don't know. Well, there's just so much that could be said Wait. in my fingers. Uh, I think that, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, don't even know where to start. However, let me say this. Uh, probably one of the things that I found most difficult is how difficult it is for people to talk about bias and prejudice. Uh, how defensive we get when someone is trying to explain their point of view. Uh, often the other may feel attacked 
by that discussion. And that is something that prevents us, I think, from going forward. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about, because Josie Kanamad is here, she and I went to Little Flower together for 12 years. Um, but I can remember as a child, uh, I was dark complected, and so there were a couple of other dark complected people. And there was a guy who was darker complected than me, who was <laughs> Mexican American, and nobody would want to date him and stuff, even I. And you know, you don't question yourself. I mean, there comes a point of what you have to say about yourself. Okay, where did this come from? You know, you see the others that, that react to you and your skin color, the language that you speak and the customs that you have, but you don't always question not only the, the biases you have against others, but the biases that you may have within your own culture. So I think the thing about understanding yourself uh, is extremely important because if you can't understand yourself, your own motivations, the, the, you know, the traditions and cultures you come from, it's very hard to understand others. And then let me just say, last week I went to the Sikh exhibit at the Institute of Texas Cultures. I highly recommend it. I learned a great deal. And for me, that is the thrill and the joy of this city, that there's so much to learn about each other. Uh, that is one of the reasons I like Washington, D.C., because it's such great diversity. I have a grandchild who's going to a, a multilingual school where every week they have a, a cafeteria, the food, from a different country. Yeah. And she corrects me if I say, was that an Indian girl or <laughs> grandma? She's from Sri Lanka. I mean, you know, <laughs> she's five years old. This little girl already is learning so much more than my limited knowledge. And I find that so incredibly great. Because hopefully, there's a hope that that generation can not grow up with the same confinement that some of us grew up with. Uh, I think that, you know, you can choose to look at the other and be a part, or you could choose to say, I want to learn about the world around me. And when you do that, you find that it's just a beautiful, colorful, incredible world. With God's name, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, I greet you in peace. God's peace be on you. This is a big topic. This is a big subject, and you mentioned fear, man. Fear, I think, on many levels is natural. It's how we react in times of fear. Uh, their fear is going to make you cautious, etc. But I think a lot of times when we talk about prejudice or being hateful, etc., it depends, it doesn't always just come from the individual him or herself. If they have a support system for that, or they have something fanning that, or there's an ideology that says this particular group is less than, or not worthy. And what happens is, unfortunately, we build ourselves up by tearing other people down. Personally, I feel very blessed, and my mother is here this evening, and my mother didn't raise me prejudice. I actually, I grew up in upstate New York. I went to integrated schools. I'm 56 years old, so I was born in 58, grew up in the 60s and 70s. And yes, we caught the tail end of those turbulent 60s with the assassination of Martin Luther King and President Kennedy and all of, all of that that we experienced. But my personal experience, my mother never poisoned me with the ideas of hate prejudice. Now all of us have our biases, all of us have the things that we prefer, but I, I, we didn't have a lot of Hispanics that we grew up around, but certainly whites and African Americans. So my point is that my hostility or prejudice towards you, you would have to do something for me to go there, to have that. So it wasn't a racial thing, it was
it's kind of an individual thing. You don't put everybody in one bag. So that's that's kind of my mindset. And then, you know, as a Muslim now today, uh, we're made up of every ethnicity, every race, language on, on the planet. So, uh, again, fear, I'm not so mad at that, but it's how we uh, react and how we're groomed and how we uh, think about those things. That, that, that that's a problem because naturally we're going to be cautious with the uncertainties and the unknown. And if we would just put more emphasis on our commonalities and our common humanity, uh, that would go a long way. So maybe I'm getting ahead of it with that statement. So I'll pass. I was struck, Rosie, by what you said about hierarchy within Mexican circles. There's a catch 22 when you're have light eyes and light skin, and you're Mexican American like I am. A lot of times you're invited into places where Mexicans are not invited, and you're sort of. I can remember being felt feeling like I wonder if I should say something. I didn't have the I didn't have the um, courage to speak up. Sometimes, sometimes I do. One of my defining moments, and again, it's my child. Um, my son, when we were living in Lubbock at the time, my son was in the preschool lab there at Texas Tech, and I was teaching there at Texas Tech, and I went to pick him up one day, and there was a kid that I hadn't seen before in his class, and they were playing, and then Patrick came out and got in the car, and I said, Pat, I said, who's that black kid in your class? And he said, Mom, we don't have any black kids in our class. I said, Pat, there's a, there's a black kid in your class I've never seen before. And he said, oh, we don't have any black kids. I said, Patrick, there's a kid I've never seen. He said, oh, you mean the new kid? He's from Senegal. <laughs> and I thought, the only way that I could define this child was by his color. And my five-year-old son redirected me <laughs> in a very, you know, perplexed kind of way and said, oh, you mean the new kid. So that really, that moment really stuck with me about those in those instilled ways that our culture has of grading people by the color of their skin, by the color of their party, political party, religion, whatever. So, anyway, that's part of the Co-founding the Peace Center story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you, Omar said something that I think is um, really generally happening more and more, and that is, in fact, studies have shown this: is that when an individual has feelings about something, doesn't matter what it is, if they find a group or others that feel that way, it strengthens them more and more, and whatever it is. I mean, hopefully what we're in tonight is strengthening our openness, but I think that's what's happened with the polarization, is that more and more people have found more and more groups to underscore what are the feelings are. But my question to you, Omar, is you said you don't feel that it's fear, but if I would do something to you, then you would have issues with that. I still wonder if that isn't about fear, how I'm, I am somehow or other getting in your face or creating dissonance with you. Is that not, I mean, I don't know. You know, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not naive, I'm not Pollyanna, you know, I don't look at the world through rose cup colored glasses, I'm, I'm aware. Even growing up, I was called the N-word, and there were certain hostel, there were certain parts of town I had to be careful with when I walked in, and we had gang-type situations that were more uh, drawn along ethnic lines. So, Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that, and uh, we, we develop certain sensitivities, and I don't know if I could really speak to your question, but for me, and I know, uh, Rabbi, you can relate to this as well, because you hinted on it already, 
growing up, and you're a little bit older than me, and some of the things you experienced. Uh, you know, the point I'm making is I have the slave experience, and, and that's that's real. Uh, and there's a whole lot of things that goes along with that. And, and after the slave experience, the Jim Crow laws, I think our parents try to shield us from a lot of that and protect us. But at the same time, this affects your psyche. This, this affects your perception. This affects uh, your sensitivities and how you react to things. And then you see somebody maybe you would think overreact, but you don't know from what deep place that that's coming from. So those are things that you, you have to be aware of. And then it's hurtful to me, you know, even, and I don't know, I don't, I don't want to dominate the time, but even, uh, I don't know if I should bring, I, I, I will bring this up at this point. I'll see if it's appropriate to do that. But what I'll say is that, man, I lost my, lost my train of talk, but I, I should have just went where I was going to go. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Um, yeah, go ahead with what you were going to say. My, my point is that if you learn certain negative things or you stereotype people or you put everyone in a bag and your experience verifies that, then there's the tendency to make blanket characterizations about individuals and people. And that's that's another problem, stereotype. African Americans are this, you know, women are that, or whatever, whatever our issues are. So I'm, I'm saying that to say that the religion of Islam has helped me to grow and evolve and broaden my perspectives and be more open-minded, more inclusive, because uh, I understand, see, you, you might think that that's weird, okay, a Muslim saying this when we see what's going on in the world today, but that's what's so hurtful for me. Uh, as a Muslim and as an African American, where God has blessed me to go and where I have grown and where I have come to, and then to still have perhaps a Ferguson or a New York City uh, or a Pennsylvania or an ISIS and all of those things, when I'm so far removed from all of that, it's hard for me to fathom how in the year 2015 we're still can go to those places so quickly. So. Comments? Well, I would say too, you know, it reminds me of, uh, of the whole idea of what happens with immigrants. Hold it um, up, good chance. There are so many stereotypes about immigrants, and you see. You know, it's interesting to see in this country as we look at immigration laws that something like 85% of Americans were ready for some change in immigration laws, and yet the public policymakers will not make those changes. It's almost as if, you know, I don't know if there's complete prejudice that's being done away with in America in terms of how they're thinking about people, but the leadership doesn't keep up with that. And it's extremely devastating in our community, it's in any com immigrant community. Uh, I think the thing about bias and prejudice is how much it hurts both the person that is biased as well as the person that is the receiver of that bias. Uh, this weekend, uh, Guadalupe Theater showed Children of Giant. If y'all get a chance, Children of Giant will air on PBS, I believe either uh, the middle of this month or the middle of April. It is a movie done by Evie and Hector Galan for PBS. And it is about the making of the movie Giant. And if any of you, probably closer to my age, remember Ooh, Giant, because yes. all my friends that are younger have never saw Giant. <laughs> my sons have never seen Giant. Uh, but it was written by the book, initially it was written by a Jewish woman about a situation in Texas between the white ranchers and the Mexican-American, basically, very basic. But Edna Ferber, who was a writer, got, you know, almost blacklisted because she talked about his bias and his prejudice. And as a matter of fact, one of the guys in Texas that owned most of the theaters refused to have giant show in San Antonio because of the portrayal of this racist society 
plus the portrayal of politicians who made laws for the oil companies. Uh, so there's several themes in here, but one of the things that you see very clearly are the children, the Mexican-American children that they interviewed from the, that, that were in this movie as little kids, who are now adults, as old as I am. And they talk about, you know, having gone to play in the baseball team and going to other little cities in, in Texas, and how they were treated. And you think about what, and he talks about, some of these little boys talk about, now men, you know, this, what bias does to the psyche of an individual. How much it crushes and kills you and makes you believe sometimes that you can't do anything, that you aren't really, well, uh, good at, for anything. Um, I think that, you know, much, much of the historical myth around the state of Texas for me has that effect because it's always been put in a way that, you know, there were the conquerors and then there were the conquered. And of course, many of us were in this conquer. Uh, and so growing up, you know, that's what we heard a lot of. Now, that you don't get it as much today, it's still in the books, but people don't think about it, um, I think, because it's easier not to think about it. But if you get a chance, do see giant, the children of Giant because there's a lot of issues around Texas, around prejudice, and around that whole idea of if you find a group that's like-minded, uh, they can do a lot of damage. Um, one of the uh, interesting features today is that prejudice has become unfashionable. <laughs> to express it openly, so people do it subtly. You know, they may be against immigrants, but they're really saying they're against Mexicans. Or, uh, so it's a good thing in some ways that the prejudice is no longer acceptable socially. The N word is out. I mean, 50 years ago it was in. So that's, that's, a, that's a positive, sort of a positive feature. Also, I think that we had a dangerous myth that was uh, prevalent in this country for many decades, and that was the melting pot. That everybody had to shed his or her own cultural baggage and become a certain kind of American, a white Anglo-Saxon American. And today we celebrate differences. We've gone from the melting pot metaphor to a symphony orchestra metaphor, where each instrument plays its distinctive sound but contributes to the beauty of the whole symphony. I like that. Yeah. I, uh, I think one of the, hear me, one of the things that I'm most afraid of is that people become invisible. And we're not prejudiced, but we also don't see. And uh, and I, I think of that movie that is almost a satire, you know, A Day Without Mexicans. And it's it's sad to see how invisible others can be to us. So it's not just that I'm afraid, but I don't even see you. I don't notice you. I'm not grateful. I don't acknowledge that you exist. It's a it's one of the saddest parts or dark sides of the prejudice. Um, but listening, I think the other issue is not just what is happening in me, prejudice or racism, but it's also the structural that is built into our society, whether it's curric curriculum in schools, the way we do neighborhoods or do districts, um, all the different things that contribute to segregation, really. And we don't call it that anymore. Uh, I think of that book, Racism Without Racists. Because none of us are racist. It's not cool. <laughs> and, and we never recognize it. And I've never met anyone that says, no, I'm racist. Or I'm having this racist moment. <laughs> and so there's a... It's, it's out of fashion, but it's still happening. So I think naming the issue in ourselves and in our society is key because this invisibility is one of the most dangerous and saddest things that can happen. In about five more minutes, one of the things that I was so struck with, we went, my husband and I traveled overseas in the fall, and we, have, we used to live in France, and so we have a lot of 
friends in France that we went and visited. And, you know, French people like to talk a lot about the United States. And the general consensus from our friends is how we have finally overcome our prejudices in the United States because we elected Barack Obama. And they didn't want to hear that it had just sort of seen that way. I mean, they really wanted to believe that we had passed that era. And, you know, that's, they want to believe the best of us and we didn't want to hear any other, any other story about that. This conversation is reminding me of when we bought the house that we currently live in here in San Antonio 20, 34 years ago. We were living overseas at the time and my husband called my son, who was going to St. Mary's University, and asked him if he would just go and pull the original deeds of the property just to have on file. My husband is an investigator, and that would be his thing to do. So my son went down to the courthouse and pulled the deeds, and he called my husband. You know what I'm going to say, Rosie. <laughs> and in the original deeds of our house in that neighborhood, no blacks, no Mexicans. So my son is telling this to my, my husband. He says, Dad, do they know about Mom? <laughs> Jim said, you know, Pat, I don't think we have that anymore from the original cut notes, but it, not, but it was fashionable at that time. Or it was, I mean, so the people would put it in writing. It was not looked down upon. It wasn't in French. It was very explicit. But it's still here today. It's just kind of gone under the in the What One of the things I would like so that we don't just sort of feel really good about, we all agree on everything here, is I'd like to, we're going to take a, a minute, a few minutes, to go inside and just think, you know, where am I prejudiced? I mean, when, I, I'm at my worst when I'm ignoring me. If I can catch, I mean, Rosie said I should share with what happened the other night. We were on American Airlines flying back here um, from Chicago. It was a, I won't go into all the details except there was a flight attendant that was so, um, what would I say, not only apathetic, but he was indifferent and angry because we were going to miss our flight and so forth. And it brought out, now this thing, he wasn't in color, he was a, probably a wasp or something, I don't know what he was. But both, he brought out the worst in us. I mean, both my because we were going to miss our flight and we weren't going to get home till God knows the work flights the next day and, and so forth. But it brought out signs of either, I mean, I'm so, I'm still mortified with the way we came across to this person. And so it wasn't a prejudice, but it was an experience where, and so I guess the question I would ask myself is when that comes forward, what's going on with me and why? What button? Well, I know I can say right now what happened with me is I had things I wanted to do on Tuesday that I cared about, and American Airlines and O'Hara Airport was screwing me up. <laughs> and I, you know, and so I don't think that prejudice is necessarily um, always like you said, about, you know, about a group or this. It's just, and when we when that side comes out, it's awful, and that's. So I would like you to, we're going to, are we just, Scott, we're I think this would be a good time yeah. to take that pause. So um, our laureate, Lynn, is challenging us all to think about ourselves. But we're, in one sense, going to open up the conversation a little bit larger. So we're all observing participants. So what I want to invite you to do, you should have found, and if you didn't, raise your hand. But you should have found an index card on your chair and a pen. If you didn't, raise your hand. And I invite you to turn to one or two people next to you. One would be better than you're working in pairs. And you know when you're in a conversation, you really don't have a lot of time to think about the next question that you're going to ask or what you're going to say, right? You're in a conversation. So I'm going to time you at five minutes, right? To talk to the person next to you about what you've heard. And you have a question to enter into the conversation. And then if you have a question on a card, and you don't have to fill out a card, by the way, but the, if you have a question on a card, if you raise it up, then somebody, Susan or Brian, are going to come and get it, and we're going to pull those together. We're going to ask one question at a time from that, that stack until 8 o'clock. 
And I'll be asking those questions to our inner conversation, and they're going to bring those questions into their conversation as if we're part of it. Does that make sense? If you're going to talk to another person, maybe come up with a question. So you can keep writing your comment or question down uh, and raise it up if you want. Those are also going to be sorted because there might be some that are similar, but we already have two questions to ask. So if I could have the lawyer's attention, please. They're busy. They're still conversing. They're just so into it. All right, so we're opening up the conversation to the laureates. We have a, a comment and a question here that you can talk among yourselves, okay? So you're staying in the conversation, laureates. You're staying in your conversation. You're just pretending there's another person there, and there are a lot more than that. But. So here's your question. Are you all ready to talk about it? Um, so we're dealing with a sympathetic conversation group here. How would your conversation change if there was this, an extremist or a big bigot in your group? How do you think your conversation might change? So, come first and watch yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say we would first have to let them take get all the air out. <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of difficult in the sense that it could be an extreme view on so many different things, and depending on what the topic is, will determine kind of how you, I don't want to say argue or debate or whatever, you know, because some, some, some things don't even, they're not even worth a response, they're not even worth the energy or whatever to say, okay, interesting, thing you for sharing, have a good day. <laughs> you know, it. But if, there, if there's a chance, perhaps, that they're on the edge or there's some anger or there's some hurt they're dealing with and you can help them process that and help them understand where their comments are coming from and do you think that that's really best if we all adopted that philosophy and you know maybe talk about that or something like that it would just depend on what, what the subject is I the also subject realize, is prejudice. Well, I, I mean the extreme. Like you said, we're all nicely up here, but you're talking about the one that hates everybody, that hates everything, right? I, I realize that you're totally abusing logic with these people. Uh, and that's why I'm glad you said you let them, let them air out. Because there are usually emotional reasons. There are usually some baggage that they're carrying with them that uh, causes this, this prejudice view for them to, to embrace. I, um, I can remember being at a function at St. Mary's where I was a speaker, and uh, I scared myself because this guy kept at it. You know, he was just really a pain in the ass, and he kept at it, and, kept, and I just got really angry and just told him off. <laughs> and he was among students, but he was an older guy. He was not a young student. He was an older guy. And then, you know, much later I thought about it and I thought, well, a couple of ways of thinking. One, one is, you know, you're the authority figure, so to speak, because you're doing the lesson or you're doing whatever. So you really should not react in anger. I mean, you should have better control. But on the other hand, sometimes uh, they need to know that there's anger. They need to know that they're not going to say this bullshit to you. You know, they can't get away with saying that to someone. Uh, so I've never quite figured out. I think I've learned better not to react so much in anger. But uh, I just think there may be times <laughs> when somebody has to be told off. <laughs> I, I would just, I would just want to say for me, even in my profession, I'm, I'm a prison chaplain by profession. Um, so I'm always in religious mode, so to speak. So regardless of what's coming at me, it is my religion or my text or my prophet uh, that gives me uh, the way I should respond. Now again, we're human and we may step outside of that, but that's the first reaction that you have. 
And so my response is going to come from scripture or something like that. So I don't know what that, that might make them more angry. I, don't know. <laughs> I, I think that self-knowledge is key. As, I, as I'm hearing you, Rosie, I think sometimes when things like that happen, I let them say what they're saying, I don't react, I don't react, but I pay for it for a whole week because I'm thinking I should have said this and 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 I didn't defend myself and I, you know, how come I didn't just tell them off? So, if something happens inside you and you just need to recognize it. Well, you know that Hobby Lobby case opened up the door for for-profit businesses to complain religious exemptions? What do you think the difference is between prejudice and religious liberty? It, it seems with the, at least the Hobby Lobby case, which I think it implied that the business could deny women getting um, health care or um, contraceptive, contraception, and so forth. Um, yeah, that's a very, I mean, to me, that really stepped on the rights of those women who, um, to me, is stepping over the line um, in terms of the separation of church and state. And that's another, what we were listening to Barry Lynn last night, who is head of um, in Americans United. And I think in this country, we have to be careful about um, allowing people to have their religious rights, but on the other hand, when it does, I mean, some woman is working for Hobby Lobby and needs to be able to have, you know, contraception and so forth. It's, again, it's very great. I think one of the biggest problems we have in this whole arena is dealing with gray. Black and white is so much easier, and that's where I think the fundamentalists um, sometimes have a much easier time. Gray is hard. And I would say, too, that this country has drifted away, I think, from the separation of church and state more and more and more. And they've made, done that in the name of God, and it is, it is idiotic in the sense that you have people making policy that say they are for the family, that they are Christian, all of this crap. And yet, mm -hmm. they deny people food stamps. Mm -hmm. Yes. They deny children health care. Mm -hmm. They deny veterans a home yeah. Yeah. or health. Right. How in the name of God mm -hmm. can you call that Christian? Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. Yeah. So I'd rather have a separation of, of state and uh, where where you can go back to what Jesus said, you know, give to Caesars what is Caesar, to God what is God. And that we are more understanding of that than to, to use religion as a, a, a blanket to hide our prejudices on them. Yeah, that, that, that's really, you, you went where I was going to go. And part of the great is because we keep changing the rules. We're not consistent. You know, we're a hardline state on this issue, and then we flip somewhere else, and we're hardline religion. That, that's that's why it's great. But we don't stay in our lane. Okay. With religious liberty, one of the biggest gifts of the United States to the rest of the world is religious tolerance. It was this country was built on it, sure. and um, it still hopes to get there. But I think that the more it drifts away from that, the, the more it loses its core identity and its gift to the rest of the world. But why do you think what is preached isn't able to be translated genuinely to love your neighbor kind of action? Because we're human and because, you know, our fears trump all that stuff that we've learned. And I think that a gathering and having a conversation like this tonight, look around this room, these are people here who have taken a Thursday evening and come out in the cold to listen to a conversation on racism. And how can we replicate conversations like this around our community, around our state, around our nation? How can we be instrumental in fostering this kind of dialogue 
and allowing people who have very different opinions than, than we do. I'm saying you lived during that time that we were just sharing in the middle there <clears throat> about how during the political season, during the election season, I start feeling isolated in my neighborhood because we're the only blue people in the neighborhood. You know? <laughs> And I think, I like these people, I like my neighbors, we go to homeowner associations, you know. But I can feel myself turning into, oh my goodness, here we go, you know. And I don't want to be that kind of person, but it happens. But if, if we can continue to build relationships with people who we don't agree with, or who, you know, we're not on the same page, but recognizing that they're raising their families as best they can, we're raising our families as best they can, we're doing what we can do. Just seeing as people. Well, my answer to that, to that question would be along the lines of, don't nobody get shot, <laughs> but uh, the hypocrisy. And what I mean by the hypocrisy is we teach certain values, but we don't reward those values, or we don't reinforce those values, or we send our children or someone out thinking it's going to be this way, and they treat people the right way and get mistreated in return, or the survival of the fittest mentality. So we put our values or do unto others whatever golden rule we put it in the closet on the shelf and say, hey, survival of the fittest, dog eat dog, I'm going to get mine, get out of the way, you better get yours. And it just it takes on a spirit of its own. And it consumes, and it hurts people. So that, that would be my response. Well, and you know, I was thinking about what Sister said too, that how we don't see people. And I think that's the very thing that happens to human beings. You know, if people are out of sight, if poverty is out of sight, all these things are out of sight. I don't have to associate with those people. Mm -hmm. I don't see those people. Then it's not a reality. Mm -hmm. it's, the only reality is my reality. And I remember this because you know, I always have to think about things for myself. And uh, I remember when I was lacking a lot of financial resources when my children were going. Well, you have a certain way you feel, and you know, you're trying to make it, and, and you're desperate, and you're trying to put stuff together. Then you start to make more money, and hey, now you've got some money saved in the bank, and now you can buy a house. And now you start to move into a stratosphere that is just. <laughs> And what you have to remind yourself is what it was like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's easy to say, well, why don't those people try harder? Mm -hmm. They could get a job <laughs> like me. You know? It's easy to say that. Yeah. And forget <clears throat> that was me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for the grace of God, for the help of other people, for opportunities that this country mm -hmm. is supposed to be good about, there go I. And I think the best part of what happens to us is the invisibility. Rather, the uh, in response to what you just said, we have to remember that in the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in the five books of Moses, 36 times we're reminded that we were once slaves in Egypt. <laughs> Never forget it. Mm -hmm. Wherever you arrive at whatever station in life, you were once slaves. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of just selfishness. We, again, we're in a culture that reinforces it's all about me and me and me. We, the whole thing, and that's something that you were saying, you know, forget everything else, it's about you being okay. And, and um, I, as I was hearing the question, I thought of that documentary, Happy. Mm -hmm. I only watched it because it was free on Netflix. <laughs> and, and I realized there's something about personal fulfillment that happens only when you go to the other in compassion. There's no number of gadgets, there's no size of house, there's no exquisiteness of a meal that will give you the satisfaction of being there for someone else. And, and that's something we have to model and teach. And let me say, now that you said that, when you said that one of the things that occurs to me too is, when you look at America, look at how compassionate Americans respond to tragedy. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> Hurricane, you know, sure. Katrina. Sure. Everybody comes to help. Whatever the tragedy is, we're ready to give and be selfless about it. Um, and it's interesting to see that, and then to see at other times, you know, the, the discord and the, the, the disharmony and the racism that occurs. It's holding these two things in the same 
group of people is amazing to me. But to understand, you know, where we're each coming from, and if we encounter somebody who's closed-minded, is there some way to gracefully open up their worldview, in a sense, without growing frustrated with our own passion within ourselves? Is there some way you know, gracefully to get to see else? a giant? Because really <laughs> I'm thinking about it now, as opposed to that. The reason the Benedict family, I think that's what they were called, the Rock Hudson and the West Taylor Fleet, the way he came around after years and years of owning these ranches and having Mexican practically slaves, um, his son married a Mexican woman. And they had this brown little kid. And so when they go into the, to the cafe and the people are trying to pick out the Mexicans, it's, he snapped. Uh, we had a discussion about how do you combat it? How do you combat, you know, groups that are organized, have resources, have the media, have learned to say Americans think, and then make crazy statements. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, the discussions, I think being curious, uh, really figuring out that we live on this one planet and we can't afford to do each other in. I mean, there's got to be a better way, and uh, and I think that we make a good effort, good faith effort to find that better way. I am overwhelmed with the turnout tonight. <laughs> um, to me, this is incredibly hopeful, and um, I'm, I'm actually thrilled. And I think that if each of us can leave and um, think about not what's wrong over there or what's wrong with it, but how we ourselves can be the change, something, catch ourselves, be a little bit more aware, because I can't impact anybody else, really. The only person I really can change, and that's not very easy, is myself. But if each of us leaves tonight, um, you all have brought an energy in here that is, I mean, I feel the, the electricity and, and you're such a beautifully listening audience. I, I just, I cannot thank you all enough and, and you are incredible for bringing us all together. I'm so, so thankful for all of you. It pulls us into another question, though. So, Lynn, you're suggesting the next step. Does anybody else in the group have a next step that you would like to take based on tonight's conversation? So, Lynn is inviting us into the next step. I think of the grandchildren. I think we need to get the children. <laughs> is, is there some way to? Duplicate this, college campuses, other venues. I mean, even though yeah, this is a nice group, nice for crowd, etc. There's a whole lot of people that's not here. That we need to have a conversation. So, well, part of the, what we handed out tonight, that's a toolkit for anybody to go and duplicate this in their own living room, okay. in your own neighborhood. The other thing we're looking at is um, giving this toolkit to every neighborhood association in San Antonio and Bear County. So that these conversations start multiplying. That's part of it. Other maybe each of us can commit to saying or being the same way in private that we are in public. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you twenty minutes on that. <laughs> so I just know the thing that's lacking for me is that I really like to know what you yeah. <laughs> other people. Like to know what? Okay. What other people think. I, I really like to know what you all think, what the audience thinks. Uh, and I know we can't tell everybody that that would be valid. By the way, this is going to be on Nowcast, and so we can all get to that and show it to others. How do you get to that? How do you get to Nowcast? It's nowcastsa.com. And also, I will send it to a link to Susan to distribute to everybody who came. Now cast essay. Correct. Dot com. Dot com.
Any other additional questions you can ask afterwards? Because I'm trying to honor everybody's time. Um, one last conversation, question, and reflection. Has this conversation, and this is for everybody, has this conversation changed your perception of anyone in this gathering, including yourself? So we never have known each other, though. So I'm, I've never had a chance to know you. Now, we've worked together on the board, and I've also known the Sisters of Charity. Uh, but it's thrilling, really, to get to meet y'all. Uh, I know we don't know each other real, real well, but certainly that's something I would look forward to. Well, look, I appreciate it, but I think that, that we did, that we were genuine. Like, I think that when you heard the conversation, thoughts, the idea, you did learn something of the person, you know what that person was about, by the way they responded to, to the question. So on that level, I think I do know a little bit more about all of us. I've always known my friend here. We've done a lot of work together. Rabbi Stone and I, it's been great. As a non-peace warrior, sitting <laughs> in this circle of peace warriors, I'm, I'm going to say it really makes me feel that the institutional wisdom that each of these people around the circle brings needs to be captured in some sort of storybook or some book, Sam. A book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sam, Omar, Rosie, Sisters of Charity, a, a, a book that has the wisdom that when, or if, excuse me, if you die, Sam, <laughs> if Rosie dies, you don't want that to go away. You want that to be captured. That this is how it was done in San Antonio. And this is, you know, this is the story of not a long thing, but I think it's an important piece of our history that everybody needs to know the stories of the peace warriors. Oh, that's just my take. Of course, I'm with the peace centers. <laughs> so I have to say, because you've been one of the founders of the peace center with them. We wouldn't be here without the two of you. And the amount of work you have put into this is incredible. And in my opinion, you should have been a peace warrior along with Dan and Susan a long time ago. <laughs> Secondly, um, now I know why we have such phenomenal public figures in your two sons. And we adore both your sons, and we just pray that we can, you have four million other kids like <laughs> How lucky we are that you raised these two. Um, I was raised um, as the only Jewish kid in my whole little, sc uh, my schools and so forth, and I had a lot of friends who went to Catholic schools, and I was scared to death of a nun. Do you think I were that good old Catholic? <laughs> and to meet a sister of your ilk is, is such, so wonderful. And I have unfortunately been in the middle of too many conversations vilifying Muslims. And every time someone comes up with these comments, I have an Omar or your wife comment, or we, we I'm going to quickly tell you one story because it, it has such an impact. We go to the Chautauqua Institution every summer, and Mohammed, whose last name is too difficult because I'm a non-linguist in my next life, I'm going to speak languages. But anyway, he is head of the Akhikan Institution in London, um, England. And he came from London to Toronto and came down through the Buffalo Air, I mean, um, immigration. And they would not let him come through immigration for eight hours. He had, this is in 2005. He had a letter from Chita the Chautauqua Institution validating that he was going to be speaking there two days later. And they, for eight hours, he was held up and not allowed in. And we heard that he asked if he could go to the bathroom, and they said no, and he ended up wetting himself. And it was beyond horror. So I saw him the next day. I adore this man. We had Sam and I just really love it. And I said, I can't believe what you had to go through, and weren't you just furious with these immigration officials? And this is the best of Muhammad, I think, speaking from Muhammad, is that he said, 
then how can I be angry at them? I was so sad that the system had turned them into such angry people themselves. And to me, he was embodying the best of his religion, the best of human being. He was a judgment. I would have been. I was furious. And to me, that is such the best. And I'd like to stop. Because it's a perfect example of compassion. So one of the things, this is one of our compassion events. Um, we've been working on compassion. And we always read the charter together. Um, if you don't have a postcard, large postcard shape, raise your hand and make sure you get one because on the front of it, it has the charter for compassion. And we always read this kind of in a back and forth style. And so while uh, some people are getting one here, I want to invite our laureate circle to read the print in uh, black. And then if the rest of the conversation would join in with them in the pink, I think it's pink. And so, uh, Rosalind, you might want to grab a mic and kind of leave the center. And I'll leave the outer portion if that will work. And then I believe Rabbi Stahl is going to bless us on our way. The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures, to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there, and to honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being, treating everybody, without the exception, with absolute justice, equity, and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain consistently and emphatically from inflicting pain, to act or speak widely without spite, chauvinism, or self-interest, to impoverish, exploit, or deny basic rights to anybody, and to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies, is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately and that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call on all men and women to restore compassion to the center of morality and religion, to return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that brings violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate. To ensure that youth are given accurate and respectful information about other religions, religions, and cultures. To encourage a positive appreciation of the cultural and religious diversity. To cultivate and inform empathy with the suffering of all human beings, even those regarded as enemies. We urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous, and dynamic force in our polarized world. Rooted in a principle of determination to transcend selfishness, compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideological, and religious boundaries. Born of our deep interdependence, compassion is essential to human relationships and to a of humanity. It is a path to enlightenment and indispensable to the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. Rabbi, can you bless us? I'd like to share a thought that I heard many, many years ago. It goes like this, and I'm going to make it gender sensitive. I sought my God but God eluded me. I sought my soul, but it I could not see. I sought my brother or sister and found all three. Amen. Thank you all for coming. You counted 70 tonight.
Are you getting?